I'm going to talk about signaling pathways that establish symbiotic associations, but I, I have to add the ubiquitous population growth slide to start with. But I want to take a slightly different perspective to perhaps what other people have. So the, the Green Revolution came in around somewhere between when the population was somewhere between 2 and 3 billion people. And uh, the Green Revolution, I would say, has, has underpinned this massive growth up to 7 billion uh, is where we are right now. Um, and, and in fact, the natural nit nitrogen cycle cannot support all of these people. That population is highly dependent on the application of nitrogenous fertilizers. So what, what uh, we have actually doubled the amount of nitrogen, or biologically available nitrogen present on the planet. Uh, uh, and we, we produce as much nitrogen, biologically available nitrogen now from the production of nitrogenous fertilizers than the natural world does. So the next one to two billion people, as John Bennington said, are predominantly going to be in Southeast Asia uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's my opinion from a food, food security perspective that the best way to feed that next one or two billion people is to empower farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia to grow enough food for themselves. And that's far better than producing large amounts of food in the Western world and dumping it as food aid into those countries that destroys their rural economies. So if you look at what's, what's causing the limitations of crop production in sub-Saharan Africa, so this is looking at the globe, I apologize for the quality, but what this is doing is, a, is an analysis, it was a paper in Nature last year, that looked at uh, maize productivity, uh, this is just maize, and the yellow areas are where productivity is very low of the relative potential, so the potential is if you take this maize line, what's its maximal potential yield? So if you're in green, where you can see most of the, the, the developed economies are, are in green, that's where you're really reaching the maximum potential of, for that genetics. So if you want to improve maize production in these areas, uh, you really have to improve the genetics of the, the crop, raise the potential of that crop. But you can see sub-Saharan Africa is not even close to reaching its potential. It's somewhere in the 20 to 40 percent range of potential productivity of maize. So there's a huge opportunity here to raise that potential productivity. If we double that, if we brought that productivity up to the scale that it is in, in the developed world, we've solved the food security problem, right? Because, and, and there's really the potential to do so because you could be up here in sub-Saharan Africa and producing twice as much maize in the world as we currently do. So if we look at what the problem is, why is maize not growing very much in sub-Saharan Africa? Um, the red is nutrient limitation. The blue is water limitation. And you can see in sub-Saharan Africa, the reason that maize is not reaching its potential is purely nutrient limitation. It's not water. It's the availability of nutrients. These soils are very low in nutrients. And there is virtually no fertilizer or very little levels of fertilizer being used in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's the availability of nutrients that's stopping the production of maize reaching its potential. Now, you could take um, the developed world approach to improving maize productivity. And that's been a very effective model in China, where essentially what China did was sub massively subsidize the production of nitrogenous fertilizers to the point where nitrogenous fertilizers are so cheap that farmers are actually applying them, often in China, applying them at excessive levels, way beyond what you need to actually increase the productivity of those crops. Now, that's had a fantastic, if you're talking about food security, fantastic. It's really solved, if you remember 20 years ago or something, people were saying, how is China going to feed, who's going to feed China? The reality is China has fed itself. Um, and, and, and from a food security perspective, it's a very positive outcome. But from an environmental perspective, that kind of approach is really not very effective. So this is looking at an analysis of how humans have impacted global systems. Um, and if you're in the green zone, then you're in the safe zone. The system can support, is a, you're in a sustainable zone. The systems are, are capable of supporting uh, uh, life on the planet. If you're outside the green zone, then you're in the danger zone. So there you're in way beyond sustainable levels. So you can see the three areas that are in the, the red zone or outside the green zone, climate change, biodiversity loss, and the nitrogen cycle. And this is pretty well all because of human impact, or, or, or uh, sorry, agricultural use of nitrogenous fertilizers. Now, this carries very significant environmental consequences as well as very significant economic consequences. And I would argue that we cannot afford to co continue to use nitrogenous fertilizers at the level we are currently using. We, we can't afford from an environmental perspective to do so, 
But I would also argue we probably can't afford from an economic perspective. And I would say the last 50 years is going to be a very short window when nitrogen fertilizers were actually cheap. I suspect the next 50, window, 50 years, they're not going to be anywhere near as cheap as what we currently have, unless we experience something like nuclear fission, unless we can find a very, very, very cheap way of producing energy, nitrogen fertilizer prices are going to go up and continue to go up and get to a point where I actually think they're going to be becoming economically unviable for uh, uh, crop pro uh, production. Okay, so obviously the reason we apply nitrogen fertilizers in the agricultural setting is because they limit plant growth. Night the availability of nitrates and phosphates are really the major limitations to plant growth, both in agricultural environments but also in natural situations. And out in the natural world, plants have this, exactly same, this exact same challenge of acquiring enough nitrates, phosphates, potassium to support their, their growth. So in the natural world, we see the use of, uh, we feel we've seen many beneficial symbiotic associations between plants and microorganisms. And in fact, the nitrogen fixing symbiosis that we hear in legumes, the interaction with rhizobia, that's, a, we, we, that's a, a major symbiosis, but you actually see nitrogen fixing symbioses really across the whole plant kingdom. Cycads form associations with cyanobacteria that benefit nitrogen fixation as just one other example. Um, the, also, of course, plants also form the mycorrhizal association, and the mycorrhizal association benefits the plant in the uptake. We often associate it with phosphates, but it's also helping the uptake of nitrates, uptake of water, and many other mineral nutrients. And in many ways, I, I like to think of the mycorrhizal association as really just an expansion of the root surface area. So the research in my group has really focused on understanding how the signaling molecules, so rhizobial bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi, produce these signaling molecules, nod factors and mic factors. And the recognition of those signaling molecules is sufficient to establish many of, the, many of the developmental processes associated with these symbiotic associations. And so my research has really focused on understanding how the plant perceives these signaling molecules, nod factor and mic factor, and how that perception leads to the developmental changes, such as the formation of a nodule, or allows the, the fungus to colonize the root. Okay, so we have known for many years what the structure of nod factor is. It's been almost 20 years now since the, since the structure of nod factor was characterized. And it's essentially a lipoketo oligosaccharide. It's a chitin backbone with an acyl tail and a number of other key decorations that are important for specificity. It was shown just last year in this paper in Nature from Jean Denarier's group in Toulouse that mycorrhizal fungi also produce lipoketo oligosaccharides with a structure very similar to nod factors. And these seem very likely to be the, the, the elusive mic factors that we've known the fungus is producing a diffusible signal for a long time. It seems very likely that, that it is these lipoketo oligosaccharides that are acting as those mic factors. Did I jump a slide? I did jump a slide. I'm sorry. Um, so. Um, we, my, re my research has, uh, I, I, along with many others, have, has attempted to characterize a signaling pathway that's involved in perception of nod factor and those mic factors that I just showed you. Um, and this is a genetic dissection, so looking for forward genetics, has identified all of these different genes that are involved in perception of these signaling molecules and then the activation of processes such as nodulation. Now, uh, uh, central to this signaling pathway are oscillations in calcium, and I'll just show you on this movie at the bottom here. This is a, a root hair cell of Medicargo truncatula that we've microinjected with a calcium responsive dye, and I, what you see at the moment is the dye just streaming around the cytosol. It's just the movement of the dye. But then we've added nod factor about now, and you start to see pulses of calcium that are associated with the nucleus that will become more and more pronounced as the movie progresses. Now, that, that is essentially a, uh, the cell undergoing signal, signal transduction. Uh, the cell has recognized the nod factor, has transmitted the signal through these receptor-like kinases into the nucleus, where it activates these calcium oscillations. The calcium oscillations are perceived by this calcium-activated kinase and transmit the signal to a bunch of transcription factors that ultimately coordinate gene expression. So, we are very interested in the mechanisms of that calcium oscillations and how those oscillations are established. Now, we've known for a long time that nod factor activates those calcium oscillations, but just as I said, just last year, we've, uh, Jean Denaria characterized these mic factors, and so we were now able to ask whether mic factors could also activate calcium oscillations. So here you can see calcium oscillations induced by nod factor. These are calcium oscillations induced by the mycorrhizal fungus that we'd shown a number of years ago, 
was the case. And now we can see that the purified LCOs from the mycorrhizal fungus, as well as synthetic forms of those LCOs, uh, all activate calcium oscillations. And those calcium oscillations are surprisingly similar to the oscillations we observe with nod factor. OK, so if we, if we, assay, if we just to take mathematics to quantify similarities or differences between those calcium oscillations, this is nod factor induced calcium oscillations looking at the periodicity of these oscillations. Here's nod factor, and here's the two MIC factors. You can see there's very little difference in the periodicity of those calcium oscillations. And also, if you look at the structure of the calcium oscillations, so the upward phase and the downward phase, here's nod factor and the MIC factors. Again, there's very, very little difference. It seems like the nod factors and MIC factors are activating calcium oscillations with very, very similar structure. Now, despite that similarity and despite the similarity in the structure of these LCOs, the plant is clearly able to discriminate between nod factors and MIC factors. So here we've treated roots with MIC factor or nod factor, and we've measured the induction of genes. So we've used MSBP, and this is a gene that's only induced in a mycorrhizal context, versus NIN, which is a transcription factor that's only induced by rhizobia. And we know that NIN is not induced by mycorrhizae, and MSBP is not induced by rhizobia. And you can see that the MIC factor activates MSBP, but not NIN, whereas nod factor activates NIN, but not MSBP. And in both cases, that activation is dependent upon the, the symbiosis signaling pathway. So the plant is actually discriminating between, even though nod factor and MIC factor are very similar signaling molecules and are able to activate very similar calcium oscillations, the plant is somehow no, knows that it's, re, it's perceiving MIC factor and activates gene <laughs> induction appropriate to mycorrhization or no, it's perceiving nod factor and activating gene induction associate, uh, for appropriate for nodulation. So there's an interesting question of specificity here. Even though you've got a common signaling pathway, how is specificity encoded? And this is a question that we've been trying to address for a number of years. Now, um, if we take a, a, a mechanistic view of this signaling pathway, um, we have receptor-like kinases that are associated with the plasma membrane. And we know that those are the nod factor receptors. They have a nodulation-specific function. They do not function in mycorrhization. But downstream of the nod factor receptors, everything else in the signaling pathway, until we get to the transcription factors, is shared in functionality between mycorrhization and nodulation. It's a common symbiosis signaling pathway. So after those receptors on the plasma membrane very quickly move into the nucleus, and we just take a closer look at what's in the nucleus, so these are all the genetic components. We have channels and pumps that are associated with the formation of the calcium oscillations. And then downstream of the calcium oscillations, we have this calcium and cow module independent protein kinase, this protein cyclops of unknown function, and then a suite of transcription factors that regulate uh, gene expression. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this protein. Because CCAMK is essentially decoding those calcium oscillations. It's perceiving the calcium oscillations and then transmitting the signals. So CCAMK is a real key player in this process because it's the switch that must be activated in order to get the downstream gene expression. Now, CCAMK is a really unique calcium activated uh, kinase. And the reason it, it is is because it can be duly regulated by calcium. So it has EFHAN domains, and those have the capability of binding calcium directly. And that's the, the case if you look at CDBKs in plants. They have EFHAN domains, and they bind calcium, and that activates the, cal the kinase. But CCAMK also has a calmodulin binding domain. So it can bind calcium in a complex with calmodulin. And this is more analogous to what we see in animal uh, activate, uh, calcium activated kinases, the calmodulin dependent protein kinases. So in many ways, the CCAMK is, has this dual functionality, and that's very unique of all the calcium activated kinases that are none that have this dual capability to be regulated by either free calcium or by calmodulin. So we wanted to understand what is CCAMK doing and what is this dual regulation of calcium? How, does that, uh, how is that important for the perception of oscillatory calcium signals? And we were thinking it's possibly key because it's perceiving the frequency of the oscillations and maybe this dual regulation is important. But we, to really understand what CCAMK was doing requires some detailed analysis of the protein. So firstly, we just needed the evidence that CCAMK can actually bind calcium. And here in the spectroscopic, uh, here we, we have uh, just to measure, we're measuring the, the calcium binding of the protein. You can see that the predominant form, when we add calcium to this domain, so the vicinin-like domain, which is just the, has the EF hands, you can see it has, the predominant form is a three, three, uh, has bound to three 
uh, molecules of calcium. So that's saying that the three EFNs are functional and they're all capable of binding calcium. And importantly, we also know the KDs of those EFNs for calcium. So one of them is 50, about 50 nanomolar, and the remainder two, two are about 200 nanomolar. But we know that between these two, there's a level of cooperativity for calcium binding, and that actually brings these KDs around to about 150, 160 nanomolar. So this is actually very, very sensitive to calcium, and that's important as I go through the talk. So regulation of kinases, is, autophosphorylation is very important in the regulation of many kinases. And in knowing that, we, we, we started to look at autophosphorylation of the protein. So there is a calcium-induced autophosphorylation of CCAMK. And that's when calcium binds to those EFNs, it activates an autophosphorylation. That had already been known. And this is showing you the calcium-induced autophosphorylation. If we make a kinase dead mutant, so it's no longer able to phosphorylate, it, you can see that autophosphorylation is completely gone. Now, we did mass spec to characterize the phosphorylated residues in CCAMK. And all of these were shown to be phosphorylated um, in CCAMK. So then we turned them all to alanine. And you can see that the predominant residue that contributes to autophosphorylation is the threonine 271. If we mutate that, we pretty well, we almost get to the kinase dead, where there's virtually no phosphorylation. So that suggests that, the phos that threonine 271 is a predominant uh, site for calcium induced autophosphorylation. And you can see, to be knowing how important this is, we made some state specific antibodies that specifically recognize the phosphorylated form of threonine 271. And you can see that when we add calcium, this residue is strongly upregulated in its phosphorylation. Now, threonine 271 was already known to us. And that's because from genetic studies, we and others, uh, that, that's Jan Staugart's group in Denmark, had generated gain of functions in CCAMK. And the, the two ways that we'd known how to, that we generated gain of functions, one was to remove all the regulatory domains from the protein and simply express the kinase domain. And the second way was to mutate this threonine 271 to alanine. And in both cases, this creates a gain of function in the protein. And if you transform the plant with that gain of function, you get spontaneous activation of nodulation. So the plant now forms nodules when there's no rhizobia around or when there's no nod factor. So this is telling us that firstly, CCAMK is a key switch. When you turn it on, it's enough to make a nodule. And secondly, it tells us that, the, that this residue, 3 adenine 271 is really central to that activation. Because if you mutate it to an alanine so it can no longer be phosphorylated, then it is sufficient to activate the protein. Now, that to me was, a, I was totally perplexed by this because this suggests an alanine cannot be phosphorylated. So it actually suggests that the calcium-induced phosphorylation of 3 adenine 271 was negatively regulating the protein or actually keeping the protein in an inactive state such that if you mutate the threonine to an alanine so it's no longer phosphorylated, the protein is now constitutively switched on. It's on all the time such that it will make a nodule. So that suggested that the dephosphorylated form of, of that threonine 271 was the active form. And that just seems to, it completely confused me for a very long time. How is it that we can have a calcium-induced order phosphorylation that negatively regulates the protein? And this was, I was struggling with this for such a long time. It's why we really started to focus on threonine 271. I knew there was something here that we had to understand in order to understand how CCAMK functioned. OK, so as I said, there's, there's multiple ways to make uh, the auto-activated form of CCAMK. And we, we found that actually you can make many deletions of CCAMK uh, to make, and you get spontaneous nodulation. So this is looking at the numbers of average number of spontaneous nodules that form on the plant. So uh, pretty well, any deletions of the regulator from the regulatory domains gave you spontaneous nodulations, even deletions that just removed a single EF hand domain. And it suggests that actually all of these deletions were what they were essentially doing was mutating or removing the EF hand domains. And that's the reason we were getting the spontaneous nodulation. Now, it was very hard to marry the observations on the threonine 271 mutations giving spontaneous nodulation and these deletions until we did this next experiment. And that was to use the state specific antibodies to ask how, what was the status, the, three, the status of threonine 271 phosphorylation in all of these gain of functions, so all of these different deletions. And the key point here is that this is the state specific antibody, so we're only looking at the phosphorylation of threonine 271. Here's the wild type showing you the calcium induced phosphorylation of threonine 271. And you can see that all of these gain of functions, 
the threonine 271 is not phosphorylated. The only one that where it is phosphorylated, and it seems to be phosphorylated in a very strong way, is this 1 to 346 mutate deletion. And for whatever reason, that is not inducing spontaneous nodulation. So there seems to be a very strong correlation in all of our gain of functions with threonine 271 being dephosphorylated and that leading to the activation of the protein. Okay, so this was all pointing at one thing, that calcium binding to the EF hand domains was deactivating the protein. And the final, the fact that the, the, the final killer for that, or the final piece of data that really told us that's absolutely the case, was Ben made some point mutations in the EF hand domains. This is just specifically taking out, rather than just deletions that can be rather large, specifically taking out the capability to bind calcium in those individual EF hand domains. And sure enough, we were getting gains of gain of functions that were capable of activating spontaneous nodulation. So, calcium binding to the EF hand domains is activating phosphorylation of threonine 271, and that's negatively regulating the protein and stopping the downstream signaling. Now, this makes no sense, right? Because we're talking about a calcium activated kinase that's responding to an oscillatory calcium signal that, that when it recognizes a signal, it activates downstream signaling. So this was all very perplexing. Um, and in fact, when we, we, wanted to, we wanted to understand a little bit more detail here, exactly what forms of calcium are, by, are being phosphorylated, and is it intermolecular phosphorylation or intramolecular phosphorylation? So is the kinase phosphorylating itself, or is it phosphorylating another CCAMK monomer that, uh, uh, it, 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 so it, intermolecular phosphorylation? And essentially, if, the, if we, this is a modeling to model the versus intermolecular phosphorylation of CCAMK versus intramolecular phosphorylation of CCAMK, and you can measure, you can just model what the state of phosphorylation is relative to the calcium concentration, making a number of assumptions in the modeling to give you these two different curves. And the, 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 the dots is the experimental data. So it's very clear here that the experimental data and the modeling is telling us that it's intermolecular phosphorylation of CCAMK. And what's, also, what's furthermore, the modeling also told us the form of CCAMK that was being phosphorylated. So C, one molecule of, uh, of CCAMK that's bound to uh, calcium at the EF hand domains is phosphorylating another form of CCAMK that is not bound to calcium. So it's intermolecular phosphorylation. Now, why is that? So we would hypothesize that this is an inactive state of the protein, and for whatever reason, the phosphorylation is stabilizing that inactive state. And I think the reason it's stabilizing that inactive state is because the threonine 271 is sitting at a very key point. It's a hinge region in the protein. We don't know the structure of CCAMK, but we can model the structure on the structure of CalModule-independent protein kinase. And in that modeling, this, the threonine 271 sits right at this hinge. And at that hinge, there's a number of hydrogen bonds that are capable of forming that can stabilize that hinge site. And if we add the phosphate in the modeling, in the structural modeling, the phosphorylated form of threonine 271 can form four hydrogen bond networks in that hinge region, as opposed to the, three, the unphosphorylated threonine that can only form two hydrogen bonds. So in essence, the phosphorylation of the threonine is stabilizing this hydrogen bond network that keeps the protein in an inactive state. OK. so. Calcium binding to the EF hands is negatively regulating the protein. So calcium somehow has got to be activating the protein because somehow the calcium oscillations are activating CCAMK. So the other side of this coin is calmodulin. And of course, CCAMK can also bind to calmodulin. And here you can see that when we look at the, the state of threonine 271 phosphorylation, when we add calmodulin, you can see that calmodulin rapidly blocks the phosphorylation of threonine 271 suggesting that calmodulin binding is activating the protein by inhibiting the phosphorylation of threonine 271. Now, to validate that calmodulin binding was a positive regulator of the protein, we undertook an alanine scanning. This is the calmodulin binding domain. And we did an alanine scanning approach of the entire CAM binding domain, converting all the residues to alanine. And you can see there's a few key residues in this, in this CAM binding domain that are essential for function. So here we're looking at the ability of the protein to complement a null mutant for either mycorrhization or for nodulation. And these two residues right here are essential for CAM binding to uh, CCAMK and are also essential 
for the functionality of the protein, the ability of the protein to support rhizobial and nodulation symbiosis. And in these two residues, right, I'll point them out right here, so they're here, it happened to sit right in this hinge region again, and in fact, uh, this leucine is sitting right next door to this arginine that forms two hydrogen bonds to uh, the phosphorylated threonine 271. So calmodulin is actually binding right in this hinge network, and it's, it's blocking the phosphorylation of threonine 271. It's probably doing more than that. It's probably having a major structural effect on the protein, considering that the, the, the cam binding residues are actually sitting in this hinge network, is probably really opening up the protein for activation and blocking the phosphorylation of threonine 271 so it can't get back into uh, the stabilized inactive state. So if we look at how CCAMK is activated, calcium binding activates phosphorylation of threonine, two, uh, of, uh, threonine 271 that blocks the activity of the kinase and blocks the downstream signaling. CAM binding blocks the phosphorylation of threonine 271, frees up the kinase, and allows downstream signaling. So what we have here is a dual switch. CCAMK is measuring two aspects of calcium. And the key to understanding how the pro protein is functioning and why it's doing this is the KDs of the molecules. So the KDs of uh, the EF hand domains for calcium is around 150 nanomolar. We know that the basal concentration of calcium in a metacargo root hair is 150 nanomolar. So that's this part. This is around 150 nanomolar. So what these EF hands are doing is essentially measuring the basal concentration of calcium. And if, if the calcium concentration is just at the baseline, it's stabilizing the protein in an inactive state. What calmodulin, calmodulin affinity for calcium is much higher. It's 15 micromolar. So calmodulin is not going to bind CCAMK until we start to get the oscillations activated. So the protein, is, by having this dual regulation, is measuring the lowest concentration of calcium and the highest concentration of calcium and putting them in competition with each other to define the activation of the protein. Now, if we can model the... Uh, put all of, all of our knowledge on all the different KDs and dynamics of CCAMK uh, and, and undergo mathematical modeling. And what it tells us, so calcium spiking is switched on at two hours and turned off at five hours in this mathematical model. And what, this do, what, the, what, what the modeling is telling us is, is that dual regulation of CCAMK by free calcium and by calmodulin makes a very, very robust molecular switch that the moment the calcium uh, spiking goes on, the predominant form of the protein is the active state, uh, and the moment the spiking goes off, the predominant form of the protein is the inactive state. So essentially what it's doing is making an extremely strong switch that is extremely responsive to the changes in calcium concentration. And the moment the calcium concentrations get above a certain threshold, the switch is turned on, and you activate the production of a nodule. We can also ask with the modeling, take it to a step further with the modeling, and ask what is the optimal switch capability. So here we can change the concentrations in the model. You can do whatever you want, right? So we can change the KDs of calmodulin for calcium and can change the KDs of CCAMK for calcium. And we ask how robust the switch is at those different KDs for calcium. So how good is it as a switch? How, differ how much differential is there between the active and the inactive state? And we call this the Goldilocks zone. So this right here is a Goldilocks zone where it's just, an, it's just hot enough and it's just sweet enough. It's just the right perfect constant con point where you get a very robust molecular switch. And that happens to be 15 micromolar. Uh, the calmodulin affinity for calcium is 15 micromolar. And the CCAMK affinity for calcium is around 180, 170, 180 uh, nanomolar. Those are the exact measurements. These are the concentrations that these are the KDs that we know. Metacargo calmodulin affinity for calcium is 15 micromolar, and CCAMK affinity for calcium is around 160 nanomolar. So the, 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 con, the KDs of the protein are put in exactly the place that makes the most robust molecular switch in this, right in this Goldilocks zone. OK, so CCAMK is a protein that is duly involved in nod factor and mic factor signaling and is very tightly regulated by these calcium oscillations. And when you activate that protein, it's sufficient to activate the processes associated with nodulation. And it's also sufficient to activate the processes associated with mycorrhization. Now, one thing that all of this analysis of CCAMK has told us is that there's really very little evidence for frequency modulation of the protein. When we started this, we were saying we've got an oscillatory calcium signal that's probably very important for encoding information. 
I don't think that's the case anymore. We have very similar calcium uh, signals induced by NOD factor and MIC factor that can allow differential outputs. Um, and what's more, the, um, the, the activi activation of CCAMK does not have anything that in indicates it's a frequency modulated switch. So it seems that all CCAMK is doing is measuring the change in calcium. So there still remains a question of specificity. How can we have the same signaling pathway and yet have two different decisions? One activates the formation of a nodule, and one activates the formation of mycorrhizal association. And we know that specificity has exists because, as I've shown you, if you activate CCAMK, it alone is sufficient to induce a nodule. And yet when mycorrhizae come along with MIC factor and activate the same signaling pathway with the induction of the same calcium oscillations, you don't get a nodule forming you get the induction of mycorrhizal specific genes. So there has to be a mechanism for specificity. And I've got to say, I am clueless now. <laughs> and one thing I've, that all of this has done is thrown out a lot of hypotheses about specificity of symbi symbiosis signaling. I don't have time to go through all the data yet uh, today, but I just show you where we are at in our knowledge of what's happening downstream of CCAMK. So again, the genetics, we've been doing genetic dissection of both nod factor signaling and mycorrhizal signaling. And what this has told us is that there's a complex of transcription factors. These are all grass domain transcription factors in the same family as the Della proteins. Uh, the complexes of grass domain transcription factors. Um, we have one transcription factor that's duly required for nod factor and MIC factor signaling. And then we have grass domain transcription factors with specificity for one or the other. So NSP1 uh, is only involved in nodulation signaling, and it specifically binds the promoters of uh, transcription factors such as NIN and ERN that we know are involved in nodulation signaling. RAM1 is a grass domain transcription factor we just recently identified from a forward genetic screen in mycorrhizal signaling. And that seems to have specificity for mycorrhizal-induced gene expression. So somehow, it seems like the specificity is defined by which complex of transcription factors form. But there's still a very big question mark at the moment in how this calcium-activated signaling complex dictates the formation of those uh, uh, transcription factor complexes and ultimately the specificity of gene induction. OK, so I started this talk. And just in the last few minutes, I just wanted to put the strategic, uh, go back to that strategic argument. I started this talk by saying we have to find a different way to feed the next 2 billion people in Africa. And that business as usual, which is application of a lot of nitrogenous fertilizers, is just not the way forwards. So how does all of this work and all of the knowledge that we've been developing in symbiosis signaling help us to tackle the next 2 billion people, uh, half of which will be in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, there's a very important component of this. Evolution me has means that what's happened is rhizobial symbi the rhizobial symbiosis has essentially usurped a pre-existing signaling pathway. So the mycorrhizal symbiosis is extremely ancient. It dates back to about 460 million years ago. And at that point, we had very, very primitive land plants. In fact, the very earliest fossil record of land plants are essentially very simple moss-like structures. They don't have a root but they do have a mycorrhizal association. It's been hypothesized that the evolution of the mycorrhizal association facilitated the colonization of land by plants. So the mycorrhizal association dates back an awfully long way in the evolution of plants. And as a result, it's ubiquitous, truly ubiquitous within the plant kingdom. We see it in the mosses and liverworts, in ferns and gymnosperms, importantly in monocots, and of course in dicots. Now in contrast, the rhizobial symbiosis emerged about 60 million years ago. And so it's clear that what happened in the rhizobial symbiosis is that it asserted a signaling pathway that had already been, you know, had been around for 400 million years and it had been functioning the mycorrhizal, signal, mycorrhizal symbiosis. And what the rhizobial symbiosis did is just evolve something on top of that pre-existing signaling pathway. So cereals have the symbiosis signaling pathway. And we know that this is an analysis in rice done by, by Uta Paschkowski's group. So they made mutants in all the symbiosis signaling components in rice. And you can see in a wild type rice, it gets heavily colonized by mycorrhizal fungi. But in all of these different symbiosis signaling mutants, the, um, I, that's probably my cell phone that's doing that. The, um, the, the fungus aborts, it, it can f associate with the surface of the root, but it can't colonize. And this phenocopy is essentially the legume mutants. So this symbiosis signaling pathway is doing exactly the same thing in cereals as it is in legumes in supporting the mycorrhizal association. What's more, we can take those symbiosis signaling 
components, we can take the genetic components from cereals. So this is CCAMK from rice. This is rice CCAMK transformed into a CCAMK mutant in Medicargo. It will complement that mutant for mycorrhization, but it also complements it for nodulation. So this symbiosis signaling pathway, and we did this very uh, many years ago, but now other people have done all of the different signaling components, and pretty well all of that symbiosis signaling components from cereals can complement the reciprocal mutants in legumes for nodulation. So that signaling pathway is behaving in exactly the same way in cereals, in, uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's functioning exactly the same way in cereals as it does in legumes in the context of nodulation signaling. Furthermore, perception of lipoketo oligosaccharides. This is a feature that's been known for many years and we thought was restricted to legumes. Well, Jean Denarier's analysis from last year suggested that mycorrhizal fungi are producing lipoketo oligosaccharides, signals very similar to nod factors, and mycorrhizae, if those were the MYC factors, then other plants must be recognizing them. And this is metacargo root air cells responding to nod factor with calcium oscillations. This is metacargo root air cells responding to MYC factors with calcium oscillations. And now we see that tomato, these are tomato root air cells treated with the MYC factors, and you can see that they are recognizing these lipoketo oligosaccharides and activating calcium oscillations. And I don't have, didn't have the space here, but we've tested a whole load of different nod factors on tomato, and tomato cannot recognize nod factors, but is recognizing the MYC factors. So perception, lipoketo oligosaccharide signaling is not restricted to legumes, it's not novel in legumes, and it wasn't something that evolved specifically for the legume rhizobial symbiosis, but probably has been around for at least 40, 460 million years associated with the mycorrhizal symbiosis. So essentially what I'm telling you is that there's very little new in nodulation signaling. There's very little that the legume does that the cereal can't do. The cereal can recognize nod factor like molecules. It has a symbiosis signaling pathway that functions in the same way that that signaling pathway functions in legumes to support nodulation. So essentially, Cereals such as maize, the main crop of sub-Saharan Africa, I would say has the, already has the innate capability to recognize rhizobial bacteria. The question has turned around, I, I would guess five or ten years ago, I was thinking how the hell are we going to get maize to recognize rhizobial bacteria? Now I'm scratching my head and saying why does maize not recognize rhizobial bacteria? If it can recognize lipoketolosaccharides, why does it not recognize nod factor? It's a much very different question. And it's a question that actually, I think, takes us much, much closer to engineering that signaling pathway in cereals. I think that we're surprisingly close because of all this evolutionary history of, the, of rhizobial symbiosis. We need to recapitulate the, the, that evolutionary trajectory that happened in legumes in cereals to allow them to recognize rhizobial bacteria. And we know that in legumes, the novel components that allow rhizobial bacteria to activate this signaling pathway are the nod factor receptors, that have no function in mycorrhizal signaling, and these, this one uh, or a suite of transcription factors that we know have nodulation-specific functions. But everything else here is functioning in exactly the same way in, as it is in legumes. Now, I wish I could say, I, 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 I'm waiting for the final analysis, but uh, I'm hoping that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will be funding a project uh, that I am heading to engineer this signaling pathway in maize and in a model, Ceteria viridis, that is an excellent model for maize, uh, in order to uh, engineer the signaling pathway to allow cereals to recognize rhizobial bacteria. I'm waiting, they're hovering over, signing the, the dotted line, but I, unfortunately I can't say it's uh, formally accepted yet. Um, but I, I think it's a very exciting time. I can't guarantee anything. It's a high-risk project. But what I can say is that uh, I, I can tell you how to engineer the signaling pathway in cereals to allow recognition of rhizobial bacteria. I cannot tell you what the ramifications of that will be. Uh, and we shall see, hopefully, in five years' time. Okay, so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge, I've already acknowledged uh, on the bottom of the slides the people who actually did the work, but I just want to highlight that the, all the work on CCAMK is a trilateral uh, relationship between three different labs here at the John Innes Center. My own lab, Richard Morris's lab, who's done the mathematical mod modeling, and Steph Borneman's lab, who really does, has done all the uh, analysis of KDs of calcium binding and the detailed biochemistry that I, I am really uh, incapable, incapable of doing in my own lab. And um, the work is funded from the European Research Council, the BBSRC, and the Gatsby Charitable Foundation. And I'll be happy to take questions. Oh, that was lovely.
real symbiosis, I think. You know, <laughs> exactly. Um, is there a possibility that the rhizobial association is a loss of function rather than a gain of function? In other words, to become symbiotic, you have to give up something. Mm -hmm. Um, the rhizobial bacteria are capable of, uh, th that is certainly the case in the mycorrhizal association. So mycorrhizae really cannot exist in the free living state. They survive as spores and, and they, they wait for the strigolactone signal. They don't even germinate until the strigolactone signal comes along. They'll even germinate a little bit and if they don't keep getting the signal, they retract, go back into the spore and go back into a, uh, 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 a, 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 a spore-like spore state. I can't think what the word is. Rhizobia is a little different because rhizobia are capable of existing in the free living state and they do survive in the soil and will replicate. But in reality, the numbers of rhizobia present in the ecosystem are predominantly originating from association with the legume. When a nodule senesces, it releases a huge amount of the bacteria. So I don't think the, the bacteria haven't really lost anything. There is a very nice, ex from the plant, has the plant lost anything? There's some nice examples. Um, there is one very nice example that was published in Nature just a few years ago, where it was shown that most, most species of rhizobia cannot actually form a functional nitrogenase because they can't make the FOMOCO cofactor. Um, and they're actually reliant on the plant for producing the, co the, the, the components, the homocitrate that it makes up the FOMOCO cofactor. So actually, in that case, if that is a real symbiosis because the rhizobia cannot fix nitrogen at all except in association with the plant because they've lost an intrinsic capability of putting the nitrogenase molecule together. I can't think of an example in the other way where the plant's lost something that forces it into the symbiosis.